So, I would suggest that we get started because we're very ready and we've been talking about the topic of AI already most of the day, but what we haven't really talked about much is what does that actually mean for us in terms of our society? What does it mean morally? What does it mean ethically? Um, and that's what we want to look at right now in this panel with our four panelists, Jörg, Sven, Johan, and Jana. Exactly. Um, we're going to let them sort of introduce themselves a little bit and maybe say what touch point you have with this topic and why you sort of feel it's important. Hi, I'm Sven. I'm a funeral director and um, we're trying to create a funeral culture uh, 2.0. Hi, my name is Jana Rasmussen and I'm a story developer, meaning that I develop stories for uh, corporates, uh, organizations and uh, most of all for, for people. I help them find their stories and tell them. Yeah, my name is uh, Jörg and I'm a philosopher and author. So I, uh, I'm writing books for young people actually, like very creative illustrated uh, philosophy books. And I'm working uh, as philosopher and trainer for the School of Life in Berlin. Uh, and there, it's like from 16 to 70 years old, people come to us and uh, if I wanted to reduce it, we work on um, emotional skills or emotional intelligence. And yeah, what, uh, how am I connected to this topic? Of course, as a philosopher, ethics is quite uh, important as, yeah, we all know the question, uh, what is a good life? I mean, uh, ethics starts there. And uh, of course, um, yeah, emotions, uh, they drive me um, far away. So this will be uh, uh, maybe my, my main topic today. Hi, I'm Johan. I'm a managing director at Textiles. So essentially I invest in early stage companies. And of course a lot of them are doing AI. So that's my connection to the topic. You have? Go ahead. Okay, um, we, we all know we are not at the point where we really have an AI with, uh, which is kind of self-confident or kind of reflective. But nevertheless, um, at one point of time, we, we will reach that point. And I'm really interested, like, what is your perception of, of the term AI? So will it be a positive thing? Will it be a negative thing? And, uh, how, and how, how, where's the touch point to ethics? Like, at which point of time we really seriously have to talk about ethics? Who? I can jump in. Now. <laughs> we need to talk about it now. <laughs> I mean... So you, you can kind of cluster uh, these topics in, in different categories, right? So you talked about like uh, essentially singularity, like uh, you know when what happened when uh, AI become conscious. I think I think this topic would be. I mean, I, I don't really really see the sense to cover it at this point in time because there are more pressing things when it comes to ethics in AI. So if you look at you know the advance in uh, autonomous driving, for example, there's a lot of ethics questions in there. Uh, that can be like the bias in the data that the, that the, uh, the self-driving cars are, are using to uh, train the model. Uh, if the data set is not representative of the population, then the machine will make mistakes. So, and uh, there's been some studies on that basically showing that uh, at this point in time, uh, a self-driving car is more likely to kill someone with a dark skin color than uh, to, to eat someone like that than, um, than a white person. Because essentially it's been trained just with white people. That's one, one thing. Then if you, uh, if you look on the other side, there's ethical questions about um, what happens if the machine has to choose between eating uh, um, a pedestrian let's say like a kid or eating a wall and killing the conductor that's another touch point but you know it, it's quite it, it's coming soon I just hear people are dying which uh, when AR, AI comes right <laughs> so we have an expert in dying so Sven what's your opini opinion <laughs> opinion about that and AI is actually not supposed to die as soon as the plug is in is put in yeah, it's it's uh, uh, it 
developed its its own uh, consciousness, uh, um, although. Uh, man-made, uh, I wouldn't uh, say, but uh, the, the human gave the first impulse, uh, the starting impulse for, for the AI, but after that uh, it, it developed its own consciousness and um, it couldn't die. So in our uh, human perception, everyone has to die, everything has to die, virtually. Uh, so it's, it's a totally uh, new dimension thinking about uh, immortality of, of ideas. Uh, it wouldn't be so good for your business, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so maybe... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, that, that could be uh, challenging for, for our business. <laughs> Maybe, maybe then at some point you have a, you have actually this is a, the show Humans. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Deals a lot with the topic of AIs becoming cognizant, um, and also the idea of, in the sense, Im immortality of the of the machine. But the fact that of course machines also age, and then humans no longer want to use them at some point. And what do you do then with a, a machine that is has a conscience to a certain extent, but becomes old and doesn't die? Ah, Jana. And that that's uh, a nice example. Of, we all know the film Wally with a with a positive uh, positive idea, a positive story on AI, a robot that doesn't die and cleans the earth for us, and it's likable and it's lovable and it's cute. And on the other hand, we have Terminator um, with Skynet that destroys our planet, and because the machines are learning um, and building even even more effective killer machines killer robots, and that's the both narratives we can choose from AI. Is it something that helps us, that cleans after us, even if, if when we're gone, because we're not a model? Or is it, uh, is it the killer robot that, that destroys us? And is it um, a thing we developed, but in the end we will die from? But isn't that the, but just, just additional to that? Like, um, I think a lot of people are afraid of AI. Yeah? If you see, if you read in the mass media, people, it's more dystopic than utopic. It's like more negative than positive because people don't really understand what's going on. So people tend, if they don't understand what's going on, to be afraid of something. So you as a, a storyteller, um, just to finish the cycle, um, you as a, a storyteller, what do you think should be improved in even explain AI and even in the, in the question of ethics which goes along with that? Uh, on my experience as a story developer, people don't really react on explaining things. Uh, you have to reach them on an emotional level. You have to really get them and uh, address their fears if they have some. So you have to tell positive stories on AI. What, what can be a positive story on AI? And not the monster in the house as the Terminator story, but rather um, how AI can improve our lives or even save us. So people should should become aware of what AI can, can do, what it really is. I will not answer that question though. But um, they should also be able to, to talk about it and, and uh, tell stories about it. So if I just can add, so we just uh, need a new notion of uh, explaining actually. So because we still need to explain. Yeah, I'm not a fan of explaining actually. I would rather tell, tell people and give them examples. All right, okay, this would be a very big challenge for me as a philosopher if we uh, stop explaining, that would be like, <laughs> okay, not a world I would like to live in, but maybe your imagination is um, like uh, far enough, big enough. Um, that's that's where, where I would like to um, jump in. Uh, if I may quote one of my colleagues like Markus Gabriel, uh, maybe one of... Uh, Uh, one of you know this guy, he was the youngest professor uh, of philosophy, in, uh, still alive of course, um, still quite young in, in Bonn. And uh, he, he's just been to Hamburg uh, talking about smartphones and uh, machine, machines and consciousness. And uh, of course his message was, uh, sorry there's nothing uh, else than logic. And uh, machines don't have consciousness, they are not conscious. And uh, he would say we are all like weird. Um, we, we didn't understand that, uh, we haven't understood that there's only logic, but uh, machine and consciousness doesn't go together. And I, if I listen to you, that's not, it's not my opinion actually, because I think we have social, social interactions with machines. We have like emotional um, relationships uh, with machines. And I think this is 
uh, where we have to start. But then when I listened to your, your questions, uh, like this dilemma, uh, you just were uh, telling um, the, the autonomous car and so on, uh, this sounds very human to me. Um, so with the, with the ear of my colleague, I thought, oh, um, I thought singularity means that machines are more intelligent. So that would mean to me that they don't have these um, human problems anymore. So discrimination, so there must be um, something more than um, this very human dilemma that you just uh, were talking about. But this is my maybe a uh, very big question. Yeah. I mean, I, I think at this point it's uh, like when we talk about ethics in AI, we talk about ethics of its creators. That's just that, right? There's no, like the machines are not sentient and I don't think they will be for quite some time. Um, AI systems are highly specialized at this point and they're not, you cannot even have communication between two AI systems. So I think we are like, quite far away from the singularity aspect. Um, and I mean, just to get a refresher on like what an AI is, it's basically a model, data, and predictions. That's it. So it's very driven by logic. So to, um, if, 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 if that's the case and we're very far from sentient, uh, sentient machines, what do you think, maybe all of you, drives the societal anxiety? towards AI, because the dilemma of what you're going to hit is a dilemma that any one of us would have in the same situation, right? Do I drive into a wall and die, or do I hit this, do I hit this person walking over the street? Um, assuming that the machines are more logical than us and can make these decisions, and they're just machines, so they don't have this ethical dilemma, what are we afraid of? What's society afraid of? Well, I think uh, the, the machines uh, will do the um, will make better decisions than, than the human because if you are driving uh, um, uh, to to a, uh, to a wall, um, your decision would be uh, um, um, an emotional one, and the machine has a um, has much more data. But um, the problem is how should how should we um, program the machine, how should the machine um, decide. So the, the problem we were talking about uh, has been researched as a, a trolley dilemma or the trolley problem. So um, what, what should the machine do? How, how could we uh, standardize the uh, decision process? Um, I think like in, in, in your case, just maybe additionally to that, I would really be interested like in if, it, if we, like humans, have the possibility to upload their brains, yeah, a lot of people are talking about that. There's even a Google startup is actually uh, caring about uh, conservating bodies for the future. So we can, our brains can even become an artificial intelligence. How, in, another business model for you, actually? <laughs> so how, how can you can you deal with that? I think the German word is pietät, uh, when somebody dies, but somebody cannot die, so the word is dead then. <laughs> yeah, pietät is, is a very uh, uh, German topic. <laughs> but uh, <whew. laughs> did you did you ever have a customer who was uh, interested uh, or talk to you about exactly that topic? No, our customers are uh, in, in these days willing to die. Uh, too too old, too conservative uh, to have these uh, um, ideas. So maybe in uh, 10, 15 years. But uh, no, actually, we, we I've, I've never had that uh, question. But did you ever think about like you you were in a pretty digital funeral service? Did you ever consider a product or a service in this f field? Yeah, um, um, so in, in the United States we will have these startups where you could uh, freeze your body or freeze, freeze your brain. And yeah, that would be challenging for, for us. <laughs> uh, if we uh, accept it, um, that burial uh, is just an option, one, one of many options. Or if, if we uh, believe that there is like 
afterlife, if we believe it's worth to uh, conserve our brains, to, to not bury. Um, and that's a fundamental uh, uh, challenge to, to our um, um, actual culture. You just talked about culture and you mentioned the United States and we were actually discussing a little bit earlier and I'm interested in your opinions on this, um, specifically for maybe for Germany in terms of data and data protection um, versus, for example, China <laughs> and the lack of data protection. How do you think that would, in a sense, affect or be a positive influence or negative influence on the development of AI in Germany? Um, and do you, in that sense, think that Germany has a moral or ethical high ground in terms of AI treatment in the future? <laughs> well, the first thing um, I'm thinking about uh, um, when I heard your question was uh, German angst. We really have the German angst, uh, uh, Datenschutz. Grundverordnung. Uh, uh, yes, but uh, uh, things uh, uh, get developed uh, um, on, on a totally uh, different level in, in German. So we Germans always ask, uh, why should we do this? And in other cultures, uh, United States, uh, for, for example, people ask themselves, why shouldn't we do this? And um, that's, that's the fundamental point. I think that's that's not the question at all because the development goes on whether we in Germany decide on do we want that or not and the world just goes on and what what can be developed will be developed and you will, we will all be able to to get technology if if it's there so uh, the question is not do we have a, a high ground a moral high ground on something but do we actually get into the debate and and uh, reformulate some laws on it and uh, just wait until wait until everything um, gets out of our hand is, is not the right answer to that. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> if you look at, you know, the state of research, China is definitely one of the leaders, if not the leader in AI, mostly because they do have access to data. And in Germany, like, we are very productive of data, which probably will also make us being slower in advancing AI compared to the rest of the world. Um, Jörg, um, you, I know you wrote a book about identity, gender identity. Isn't that an ethical question too? Like when, when I have an artificial brain, do I, I, don't, I actually don't really have a gender. I, I, I'm not sure how to solve that. Like you use bee stick or something. But <laughs> um, like, do you see their problems? Well, um, should I uh, give now the hard answer or the very disappointing, or the very <laughs> um, destroying answer? That would be like um, if you ask like very um, feminist and female philosophers. Um, there's one uh, very great philosopher, the woman of Paul Auster, um, and she uh, says, well, it begins, start with that, that this um, brain, this artificial brain is already a male uh, fiction. Um, there wouldn't be so many women uh, uh, having invented this this uh, one. So it's um, actually geniusly a very, very male um, fiction or fantasy, if you want to put it like that. And that's what, uh, yeah, what, what I'm thinking about all the time now listening to you is that um, human being is missing in this, um, in this case. If you look at the... Um, evolution of a human being and if you look at the history then uh, you can ask what is so specific about um, uh, the human being and maybe this is one answer also on a cultural level why there is so much anxiety because we we are feeling that uh, we are not valuable anymore there's nothing nothing special about being human anymore and all these and I mean some of these um, uh, readings about um, about how it will be singularity and all this it's, this is, sounds like science fiction a little bit yeah it can it can make you an anxious but um, actually when you look at the history of human being then what it's so specific what it's so typical about being human and that's that we can cooperate yeah? and that's uh, I mean uh, Jürgen Habermas would put it like that it's a uh, very the special property to um, have cooperative uh, sociability, sociability, and I, 
um, thing that we have to relearn this and that we have to look at the human beings uh, by storytelling and by all tools that we have because we, we won't solve their problems only with uh, talking about machines. We have to evolve. We have to uh, have uh, rather an ethics of disruption more than an ethics of AI. I mean, we have to have both for the future, but actually at this moment and for the next uh, 20 years, we, we, human beings, we have to relearn what disruption means and uh, an ethics of disruption. I think this is far more urgent and far more important than uh, talking about some uh, uh, male fantasies that will uh, never come true, actually. What about a pack of wolves? I mean, they, they do cooperate, don't they? Yeah. Yes, sure. But uh, I just read a uh, very funny uh, that you uh, mentioned the wolves. That um, this dog uh, face that you know, like, yeah, this is not naturally. Uh, the wolves don't have the muscles over there. Um, we learned them. We taught we taught the wolves to to make this very sweet and uh, sad dog face. Uh, but this is actually what human beings were teaching them. Uh, they didn't do it naturally. So. Um, I wonder, would you like to say that there is no difference between a wolf and um, a human being? No, but you, you just said um, what makes us human is our ability to cooperate, yes. but, but um, animals also cooperate. Yes. So um, I'm not a Habermas specialist, but could, could you lay that out for me or maybe reframe it? Yes, yes, sure. Of, co of course. I mean, you can go to the difference between human being and animal, and then you can say, of course, they cooperate. But there's one fundamental difference. The wolves didn't invent uh, machines, and they, done, they are not talking about AI. So <laughs> that's where our problems start. We have to, uh, we have to discuss it. Uh, the wolves uh, can't help us. And maybe, of course, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm reducing it very much. In the last uh, 2,500 uh, years, uh, there were like consciousness. The human con we thought consciousness is very specific uh, f and typical for human beings. It's not. Of course, animals do have consciousness as well, and maybe some other uh, non-vivid uh, um, material too. We don't know. I, I guess. So then, that was the language. And that starts already. I mean, we communicate like wolves communicate as well, but we can communicate by, uh, by words and by a little bit more emotional meaning, more mental meaning than animals do. And then we get to the um, last point, and this is morality. And this is the, actually uh, for our century, and uh, it will be very decisive whether in which direction we will solve that problem. Um, the last argument for the difference between human beings and uh, animals is that we are quite uh, we are free we have the free will to um, behave in a moral way we can decide whether we want to have a moral decision or not or m moral um, encounter encounter or not animals can't do that this is the last argument uh, for the rest, biologists say they know there's like uh, 90 over 90 percent is genetically it's uh, very similar. And then we come, of course, to the culture, where there's quite a slight difference between animals and human beings. But today, for the artificial intelligence, we can say that morality and the very specific uh, cooperative sociability, this should be in an ideal world, an ideal world um, where human beings are still, still when there is singularity, are still like kind of um, uh, the main protagonist. As you said, if I can... Um, Relate to that, uh, there is still the ethics is for creators, not in the first place for the machines. So, how do you regulate that? Do we want to make sure then that we keep those essentially human qualities, or do we just sort of let innovation happen? Uh, maybe I give another example. What we are just, we are not only in an artificial intelligence revolution now, because I think this is quite maybe. In, few hundred years but we are now having uh, real experiencing a media revolution like uh, through social media Instagram and all that we have this Rizu affair uh, now in Germany where first time I mean he's, he's even more powerful than Jan Böhmermann um, still a classic comedian in television but there's a blogger now uh, who really um, yeah who really destroyed kind of uh, a main um, 
uh, party. So, um, and we are having this media revolution now. We experience it in experiencing it in, in, in maybe in areas where we don't look. At. So I find it's, for example, it's very important to look at the gaming industry. Um, they have more revenue at the moment, last year they had more revenue than uh, the film and music um, industry together. So, and we, we don't, uh, maybe you guys, because you're in the tech um, industry, maybe you have a look at, um, at the gaming industry, but uh, so the normal, I don't know, newspapers like the Zeit or uh, Die Welt, they have no they pay no attention to all these uh, developments that are going on. And I think this is, for us human beings, for us as a society, even more urgent um, than uh, the other questions. So I think we have to, to build up this uh, cooperative soci sociability even more. So we should focus more on that. And then, of course, on the relation between um, uh, human beings and machines. But for that, I think we also need explanation. More explaining, more understanding. Of course, in an emotional <laughs> thing. Yeah. Yeah, have you tried to convince somebody by PowerPoint? Who has tried to convince people with the PowerPoint presentation, the audience? Okay, how did that work? Hmm. Okay, how, who has tried people to, to convince people or to get people on board with an emotional aspect, like with a moment, sharing a moment or a story? Okay, and how, how did that go? Okay, yeah, I think, well, my, my experience is that logic is highly overrated to get people on board. We, we need definitely need logic, but you do not convince people with bullet points and arguments and, and PowerPoints. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I know because we talked b before this, um, before we even talk about uh, artificial intelligence, we should reflect on what makes us human. And there's a really nice series um, called Altered Carbon on Netflix, maybe some of you have seen it, and that actually uh, tackles the question, what makes us human, because the, the wealthy people can, uh, can be immortal because they buy new bodies, they call them sleeves, and their, their whole consciousness and their knowledge is in a stack in, in, in their backbone. That would make your business pretty uh, <laughs> disrupted. <laughs> Um, and what makes us human is our ability to, to connect emo on an emotional level. And uh, the funny thing is that, that um, what I do in, in leadership trainings is to get people in touch with their emotions. And I actually get paid for that, to, to feel their own emotions and then address their employees and their teams on an emotional level with stories. And it's all about digital transformation and people get back to, for digital transformation, and I'm not even talking about AI here, we need to get, we need to connect with people and we need to get people on board. And to get back to a question on anxiety, people are hugely afraid of the unknown, what they don't know. So we have to, we have to make it uh, tangible. And it's like there's a saying, how do you eat an elephant? How do you eat an elephant? Slice by slice, yeah. You make it in tiny little pieces and you make it tangible and, and um, edible. So and that you can only do on an emotional level where we connect on, uh, emotionally with other people. And I think that's what you do with the, with the school of light. With yeah. the school of life. Yeah, and there's even uh, like mainly a, a lot of research that uh, confirm what you say because there's no morality without emotions so you need the, you can't have it in a very cold uh, uh, rational logic way you can't have um, uh, morality so morality and ethics um, is um, uh, belongs to to emotions actually and but what I'm missing a little bit is this fear of losing my job I think this is even more important than fear of the un, um, uh, being afraid of the unknown. I mean, I think a lot of people, when you go to their daily lives, um, they have daily fears. That means like very close to their lives. And that means what's happening with my job, what's happening with my families, what hap what's happening with my kids. And then, of course, there come these things we uh, experience today, like what's with nature, what with, with the future and so on. But I think the, the, the strongest things that push people is like, Job, family, love, and uh, yeah, Security. things like that. Security, yeah. So to go back to the to the topic of uh, emotional connection and um, media, we're also at a point where a machine can actually generate like piece of fake news, 
to actually resonate with an audience, even test it with an audience and get the data back and kind of tweak it in a way that it actually resonates with more people. That's how you influence elections and things like that. So it's not a unique human thing. Machines can do that. And they can do it at a scale that we can't even do. So I, I think that's where like, th there's a need to have like, um, you know, like, probably like government bodies who, which regulate those kind of practices. Because it's going to get exponential. And we, like, the machines will be able to, I mean, it's a machine, but of course the creators of the machines, but we'll be able to, um, um, to manipulate uh, massively uh, people. So what I kind of heard is that we first of all have some problems we have to self, uh, fix for ourselves as humans before we can really talk about ethics, in, for example, with an AI. Yeah, kind of. That's kind of, and people. But on, on the other hand, people try to scale themselves nowadays. Let's call them influencer. They like they they try to come as close as possible to an artificial intelligence who might be scalable all over the internet. So they they use all their channels. They try to influence people like a machine could do maybe, and that's something that what I understood. Maybe maybe you can correct me, but. That's something which is not solved yet? No? Yes? How far are we away from, from a common ethics before we actually should consider to talk about an AI ethics? Well, actually, of course, we should, because it's, of course, always better to do it before. We now have the problem with um, freedom of speech. Um, there was a major uh, politician, uh, uh, AKK, I love this word in <laughs> I love this word in English. AKK. I just waited for uh, uh, saying it out loud today in English. Um, she was like uh, saying we have to regulate more um, our um, freedom of speech um, in social media, and I think of course this this is true. We need some rules over there uh, and other rules than we have um, today, and we are we are late of course because the the machine is already. Um, yeah, going uh, so far, um, and maybe it would be a good idea to start earlier, but yeah. But there are some examples where people cannot really differ if they deal with a machine or not. So at the, m at the, at the moment we are at the point where a, a machine can simulate a chatbot, can simulate a four-year-old person, and you can't differ if you deal with a child or with, with a computer or with artificial intelligence. Um, so there's a specific IQ programmed into that. So now we can talk about intelligence and intellect, definitely. But as, at a specific point, um, this will continue, the development will continue. And so none of in this room might differ at a speci specific point if we deal with a human or with an AI. And at this point of time, we have like a serious ethical question. Can we switch off this computer? Yes or no? if we cannot differ if we deal with a person. Well, until you didn't solve that problem, you have to label these bots. I, that, I think that's the first thing. I want to know to whom I'm talking. So if it's a bot or a human being, and I'm, I have no problem with the third, um, uh, the third gender, for example, so we can make a fourth gender like a uh, machine gender. I'm, I'm fully, fully, uh, I fully agree with that, and I think there's no, no problem with that, and we, we will have to, I think we will experience that, we will have that. Uh, there will be a, a, a machine gender thing. But well, as long as this is a as as it is a human society, um, the superior will be um, against human nature, if you ask me. But um, there will be some human beings who will um, follow that idea. I'm sure. We may actually need a, a definition for this for a bot because there was a uh, there was a case in Switzerland a couple of years ago uh, with an arts exhibition. It was a it was an experiment, a project. Um, and they programmed a bot to go shopping in the dark net. Uh, artists did that, who could, uh, who could co code, apparently. And they, um, <laughs> or programmers who were artists, who, whatever. It was an arts project, and uh, there was an exhibition about that. And uh, that, uh, that bot sh went shopping in the dark net and uh, 
bought drugs and weapons and other forbidden things, and it was actually arrested by the police, and they 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 kept the code and they the the uh, and the Swiss uh, police, and um, yeah, there was a huge uh, uh, huge media uh, discussion about it, what to do with it, and who was uh, who was to be. Um, who was the owner of that, and was it was it something that uh, had to be forbidden in the first place? And uh, it was, it's not a joke. It's you can read it in the Guardian. Um, and uh, then they re released it at some point and said, "Yeah, you did not have the uh, the responsibility for your actions." So we may actually, I think we we are at already at that point where we have to tackle those those questions. And and Christian Rauda's uh, uh, ideas uh, would would I, I would like to hear on that as a. As some, as a person of the law. Yeah. Yeah. I think that bot even went uh, further. Uh, in my opinion, it even uh, generated bitcoins with its artificial intelligence oh, wow. uh, that it spent yeah. uh, for drug shopping. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no, it was uh, <laughs> such a crazy idea. So, one question for me: Would you all say that uh, if there is a competition between human beings and uh, like robots or bots or buying anything or doing things like human beings are doing, um, will they win? What, what do you say? Yeah. Okay, there's, there's actually an example, like two examples. Um, just imagine I have a lot of Picassos and I program them into my computer and my computer actually recognizes a style and copies a Picasso which is actually in the style of a Picasso. It's possible. Same with, uh, with musicians. If I have Mozart uh, symphonies, I can program into the computer and the outcome will be a symphony where experts might say, oh, that sounds a bit like Mozart. So they asked people about that. And some people said, oh, uh, they thought it's human-made. And they said, oh, that's beautiful. And as, as soon as they heard it's made by an AI, they said, oh, it's not interesting. So. What you said before, like ethics and morality, is based on cultural perception. So is, isn't that a role model for exactly what you were asking? Would you like to answer this? Then I have a little bit of time to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Please reframe the, the question for us. The thing is, how, how do we deal with that if we consider morality and ethics as a cultural-based thing? And um, we, we don't know if it's from a computer or from a human. So a computer might just need like milliseconds to compose something where we would have huge respect if a human would have done that. Um, how can we talk about a fourth gender, for example? How can we accept that? And even even not saying, okay, you are not superior and we don't even like what you're doing because you just need a little piece of the time a human would need. But doesn't it depend what you consider superiority? I mean, then we can have a whole conversation about what actu it actually means to be superior. And is it superior to be able to do something faster than a human that's good, as good as Mozart? or? Is human superiority based on something else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is now really the question: What what is art about? So, oh, what's yeah. the definition of art? Who can be an artist and who not? I mean, there. Uh, I think we all agree that there are like very very good artists and not so good artists, and so there there were always like different levels. And uh, I'm missing the morality in your example. I think uh, making uh, composing composing an artwork is it's not a genuine genuine moral uh, action. This is uh, so. That's why I'm. I think it's not the the point I'm about, because there is no no mor morality in there. It's just okay. Yeah, it's skills. They are better and faster, for sure. But then they have before you can copy um, and mix a David Hockney picture in in a new frame. There has to be David Hockney. I so can reframe it for you. yeah. <laughs> But first, what about uh, having respect for the creator? Of this AI that did that, Because maybe maybe that's art as well, right? Yeah. Maybe actually it's it's many creators, and I learned that it's AI is more a male idea, but females, since they're fifty percent of the population, will have to deal with that too, and they might be confused too if there's a per person or an AI talking to them. But nevertheless, like just to just to reframe it again. Um, 
culturally based, if we say ethics and morality is culturally based, I used this example to say, okay, AI might, might be able to make a decision itself in milliseconds where maybe 10 humans would need half a year to decide something. And the decision might even be superior or more rational. And uh, this is kind of the, the, the direction where I was heading to. Do we respect that decision even though it's better, less or more? Or should we respect it more? So, yeah, I think that's really um, either this is uh, based culturally or emotionally. What I was about was that morality um, grounds on our emotions. And so I think all our perception of the world is, is based on emotions. So actually for me it doesn't make then a difference uh, if, I, if I like it. Of course for art it was always like that. I mean they were like artists, um, uh, they didn't do their own um, artworks because there were some um, people who worked for them, uh, assistants, they did it. So, and we said, oh, that's a nice war hole, but he, he, he didn't even, he only um, uh, make a, made a signature. So I think it's not fundamentally new. Maybe it's better, it's faster, and I think for this super superiority, is of, it's fine. Why not uh, uh, use this uh, category of, yes, they are superior. Like in uh, playing, playing chess, they are superior. I yeah. have something for Sven. The thing is, do we maybe respect the work of a human because time, we, we use time for that. Like a Picasso, they, he needed months or years to finish something. And the AI might just need a nanosecond. And people wouldn't be able to differ if we don't tell them. But is it the respect of the person, of the lifetime of the person, we, which become part of our ethical decisions? Actually, we were talking about uh culture. We're talking about emotions and about culture. So uh, without emotions, without culture, we don't have any respect in, in these uh, categories. And in my opinion, um, life, is about, life is short. And uh, so is the, uh, that influences the, the perception of, of culture. You only have a limited uh, amount of time to uh, uh, consume, to perceive, to, to uh, enjoy life. And in and, and that point, uh, it, it becomes uh, totally uh, uh, um, meaningless because AI has an uh, unlimited uh, lifespan. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, at, at least in, in uh, cultural sectors, uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's change the variable of this, <laughs> this thing. So, say you have an artist that's been, you know, two years on a, on a piece of art. Um, and then he learns coding and he spent five years building an AI that can do really good work that is probably greater than what he did before. Is that less, is it something we should consider less than the original work? Because the time can be actually from the creator can be also longer, like you could have invested a lot of time in building that. That I think you, we should have respect for this kind of work as well. Should we? Like, um, the thing is, what, what you said, Jana, before, um, if people don't understand something, they might be confused sometimes and they might have a different perception or a perception which doesn't really meet the reality. So I think if you are, for example, a coder, for, for most of the people maybe in the room, a developer or coder is a magician. You don't know what they're doing. Yeah? So it's pretty hard. That's pretty harsh. It's, it, that's, that's, it's, that, that's your assumption. I, I know a lot of coders, you know. <laughs> and they're all magicians. <laughs> they, they are all magicians and uh, in their community, they know what they can do in their community that it's evaluated. But the normal person cannot evaluate their work, their, their art. They cannot. Um, but a piece of art like music or, or a piece like a picture is like mass media kind of. Everybody could have an opinion about that, but not how somebody codes. Yeah, 
Uh, I agree on that, but um, I think it's still an assumption that, that you make uh, what people think about uh, everybody. And th the question is, is we, don't have a, we don't have a shared reality, that we all have our own reality and we hope or we believe that we're, there's one reality for everybody. Um, what we, how we judge on situations and what we think people think of us is uh, hugely developed by what we, uh, who we are, who we, th what we think about ourselves, how we grew up, what our conception of of, of ourselves is. So um, that's where that's where uh, the problem with the uh, communication starts. That when we talk about a topic, we both assume we're talking about the same thing, and that's very often not the case. So it, before we even talk about artificial intelligence we should tackle this problem, how, how do we communicate and are we talking about the same things? We don't have the time to, to wait until the first is, is sorted and then go to, to the AI questions and we have to do all at once. And this is why it's such a stressful time because people, um, through all the digitization, um, we realize that we as humans are not ready for that but still we have to and we have to react now and we have to deal with it now on an ethical and also on a tech level. So we have different realities but we should work on a common, on a broad perception of stuff to un understand and evaluate it more? We should work on understanding the other more than trying to get my own message across. Ask more questions rather than give answers. Anybody? <laughs> Two minutes to go. Two minutes to go. Um, I was actually. I just had a. I just had a thought, and maybe this is a good a good kicker for the for the rest of the time. I don't know because you talked about the question of respect, right? Do you respect um, an AI's work less than you respect a human's work or more? Um, and I had a very biased thought that came to me, which was, why would I respect what a computer does? So I would respect the person who programmed the AI and think that's great work. But if an AI paints a Picasso, it's like, cool story, bro, you're a machine. <laughs> like a human and the craftsmanship that it takes to do that, for me, I guess, brings respect. And I think that comes back to emotions and you know consciousness and being able to connect with people. Um, maybe if at some point we're able to connect with the machine, then I would respect the machine, whatever gender it is or not. Um, but I thought that was an interesting thought because there's already a bias from my part being like, why would I respect a machine? Like it's not a person. So that I wouldn't attribute a feeling like respect to it. I don't know how you think about that or if that's part of a sort of the ethical moral dilemma that we then have, but yeah. I, I think we even have, like, for the question, we are close, close, close to the questions. Like, Sven, if you want to finish that, we have Christian over there. He is like a media lawyer, a pretty good one in Hamburg. So, But he might be a personal lawyer for the personal rights of a AI in the future. Maybe we can discuss that afterwards. <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting um, if you worked for the um, AI machine from Zurich. But the, the, the question, uh, the, <laughs> the, the cultural question is, uh, um, what does an uh, um, AI make with drugs and weapons? <laughs> so uh, these are all uh, human categories. And so in, in this point, it's, it's a human-made art, but the art is, is uh, on, on another level, not uh, above, above the AI. So AI is just a stupid, intelligent machine. <laughs> Microsoft had this Twitter agent, I don't know about uh, if you know that, but it was fun, check it out. <laughs> I would say we open up for questions now, right? We only have two semi-working mics, so I guess I'll jump around. Here you go. Yeah. Maybe say your name and then yeah. Yeah, two sure. words after Yeah. Um, Amar Jamal, I'm from Bering Point. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, thoughts. Um, uh, very interesting. Um, a little too much death uh, we've been talking about here, but um, it's all right. Um, I, was, um, I have one thought, and I believe you uh, brought that up. Um, it's um, this potential of um, having um, AI be being misused, um, having an exponential um, um, growth here. Um, for example, in Germany, there's this, um, you know, this, this Enkel trick. There's this, um, where, where people sit in a call center calling old people, um, 
pretending they are their old nephews, they, they are in urgent need of money, and they need 2,000 euros or whatever. Um, there, is, uh, there was this conference a few months ago uh, where I believe Google introduced um, a, a machine, um, uh, a personal assistant who is able to um, call, up germ uh, call up people and um, asking for an appointment at the barber's shop. And, they, and that was this, this idea, the, the, the one who was, who, was, who was being called up wasn't, be, wasn't able to tell that he is talking to a machine. And, and if you combine that, um, for, um, or thinking about that, um, what, would you, what would be your opinion on um, having the need for A, some strong regulation, or B, at least some sort of ethical framework in, what, in, in which this whole development of AI would be able to be streamlined and channeled? What's your take on that? That'd be interesting. Thanks. Yeah, of course you need regulations. I think that's why um, there are some lawyers and even more people who are um, thinking about it, working about it, working on it. Um, but my question would be, if just the scientific uh, look at it, how many times can you repeat this situation? So for a system, systematic um, answer and solving the problem, uh, you sh it should be capable to, to repeat that situation 100 times, 1,000 times. Um, this, this, fraud, this fraud idea? Yes. Well, I think the machine will be able to do that better than us. Right? Like <coughs> That's Google Duplex, by the way. Um, I mean, yes, I, I, I think there's definitely a need for, like, uh, regulations and like that is kind of being worked on or at least there, there are some groups forming uh, around you know ethical use of AI and I, I, yeah, I think it, it is really needed because that's like a soft case but then you have like real weaponization of AI uh, or like AI in weapons as well which pose like another type of ethical problems. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think uh, um, you really have, have to label it. I was just uh, thinking about uh, some, some online dating platforms uh, that hire people um, to chat uh, with, with men seeking uh, women there. And it, it, in my opinion, it would be totally the same uh, um, situation. And they have to label it. So there's a, a small uh, asterisk saying, um, we pay people uh, chatting to new. Um, they are not real. <laughs> Lawyer question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there seems to be a common sense that we have to know whether we deal with an AI or a human. I can understand that in that uh, case with the online dating. But in general, why do you think do we have the right to know whether there is a difference, whether we should know it's a machine or not? Why? I think when the expectation is that I'm dealing with a human being, that I'm communicating with a human being, and I know a lot of people who have no idea what bots are or do, and they're my age, so um, then you should know. If why? Uh, because it's it's for me it's it's a uh, it feels like fraud. And that's just that's my pure emotional uh, reaction on that. I, I think there's also a question of scale. Like as human being, we are not really scalable, right? Like if you want to uh, to fraud uh, one million people doing phone calls, good luck doing that as a human. Whereas a machine can do that quite easily, probably in a matter of a few hours. So I think that's where that kicks in. That we we need some regulation around that because we can. I think in that case, yes, it is, but but I think it it's still it's going to be difficult to differentiate between um, you know potential misuse of the technology 
and uh, and cases where it's it's irrelevant. Yeah, I think it's a it's a question exactly what we were talking about. Uh, it's a question of respect and. Um, or I agree, we can learn it, but then it's still our task uh, of today that we, like all the things we learn in, in our culture, how to appreciate um, an artwork, how to uh, talk to each other, how to be nice with each other, how to show anger, we all learn that. It's all based on learning. And uh, I would say uh, we, then we need to learn um, how to connect to a machine. And I think there is a... Um, we, we have to inform each other to whom you are talking, whether it's human or not, and we have to uh, develop some skills uh, to this point of respect, because we have to learn how to respect a human being, because I would be very, very, uh, a machine, I, would, uh, I want to say, how we can respect uh, communication with machines, we have to know first of all, and then when I look at the history, what we did with the animals, I would be very pessimistic. Uh, about saying, oh, there's no difference, we don't need to say, it doesn't matter, um, as we have like our pets at home, uh, and we have uh, other stories um, where we misuse um, our power with, with animals. And I think uh, it will go the same direction with um, uh, AI in this sense. And, I mean, to some extent, is um, like we talked about art before, uh, you probably want to know if you buy a fake Picasso. Yeah even if it looks just like the real one, right? Yes, it's exactly the same thing. Fraud. We already have criminal law and also the income and take. We don't need new regulation. This is completely, this is illegal to say whether there is an AI or not. This is law today, nothing new. Okay, let's get, get back to the emotional part of this. Do you know what a mixtape is? Have you made mixtapes you don't have to answer that, but have you made mixtapes for girls? Okay. So what's the difference between a mixtape, Christian, you made, and Spotify? Yeah, it's a personal selection. So it's personal. What else? You, you, and you, you, are, you want to answer that too? No, I, I would build up on that actually, but, but you guys go ahead with <laughs> mixtapes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's more it's more personal, but but um, why does Spotify make make lists? No, I I have a question to you guys. So okay, uh, <laughs> you can answer your question yourself, maybe. Yeah. No, I want York to answer it actually because we had this mixtape discussion on on Facebook before this. Okay. No, I I really need no further information. We can do it together. But in in which direction would you like to go for this example? <laughs> it's, it's the same, it's actually a, a, it's a, an analog version because that was made on, on cassettes. My, some of you may re, uh, remember that, um, a cassette player. And, um, and the other one is a, is a digital solution and that's, it's an it's a, um, it's an a, it's a algorithm that, that learns what a girl likes or a boy likes, what sort of music you like. And what's a mixtape? You make a selection, and you and you want to tell a story, or you want to tell like 20, 20 stories, and you want to get a message across. And it's not e it's it's more than personal. It's it's it has meaning. Is it again time? Because I I spend a lot of time thinking about what I yeah. put on this mixtape because I really want to impress my potential partner. And I can Spotify I can just do it like this. Not there, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I would have a lot of to say on this as well, but but my point is a different one. But I'm but I'm building up actually. Being a researcher on moral philosophy for most of my life, and I've worked with a lot of artists in the Center for Political Beauty for many many years. Um, to be honest, I see a huge danger here, and that's romanticizing and anthropomorphizing artificial intelligence. Because I, I get your point with the um, emotional empathy as a fundament for uh, moral and ethics, but we've never seen that. Why would an AI that's good at reading John Rawls come up with a very, very good moral fundament for a society in which it wants to live with human beings? Have we been good? based on our emotions in building up inclusive and just societies, not really. We started in 
Athens, it took us centuries to include women. Uh, we're still doing specificism when it comes to animals. So the, the, the risk that I see, and I've listened to you, uh, uh, I, I personally believe being close to that risk, is believing that we are better than an AI at some point of the history of AI in being moral. We would love to be that way, and Catholic Church has told us for decades, centuries, that it can only come from a, a godlike human copy, but we have no proof yet. So that, that's actually my point. And, and, and time, to be honest with you guys, um, if time spent is the most important thing to value with your partner, then get a dog, right? <laughs> uh, or get a cat. If someone builds me a nice, personalized, Spotify-based playlist, in 10 minutes, why wouldn't I value that? It's 2019, it might have took them longer in the 50s, but come on, I mean, that's nine minutes more he or she can spend with me listening to that music. Just, li just last thing, do you, do you like shots or do you like red wine? Both. <laughs> I would guess shots. <laughs> Thank you. I think it was a nice jam session. I hope you enjoyed it. And yeah, time to switch the stage or stay here. The program is continuing. Thank you.